Ooh, it's quite a cold one today. We've even got ice on the doors. Workshop vlog number 15. Let's get our tool cabinet open before we start the show. There we go. It's a side. Lovely. Okay guys, workshop vlog number 15, like I said. Now this is just my opportunity to check in with you guys, answer some of your questions, give you some updates on some of the projects. I want to do some tool updates in this video, so I want to look at the Bosch track saw the Vertas honing guide, a few little issues I'm having around the workshop, and uh, like I say, answer some of your questions about the tools and stuff that I have in this shop. So, hope you're all doing well in these tough times. I know everybody is going through some really hard times at the minute, and uh, yeah, we've had some hard times ourselves here. I won't get into it, but uh, coronavirus is affecting everybody, and it's quite tough for everyone at the minute, so that's the kind of situation we're all in, so we're all in this boat together, just to let you know, and uh, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of tough for all of us at the minute. So let me take you around the workshop and I'll uh, show you some stuff I'm having, issues that I'm having with tools and stuff, answer some of your questions. I have some condensation issues in here now because it's so cold outside. The frost is causing me some issues with my roof. So I should show you that. Uh, update on the MFT table and an update on a few projects. So without further ado, let's jump in and have a look. All right, so first thing to discuss is condensation. Now, I have a non drip roof which is dripping uh this has only happened this year well i've only had this shed two years but we're having some a spell of cold weather at the minute and uh, this side is in the shade so the sun hits this side and the ice that's staying on the roof is causing the inside of this to get wet and this water is actually frozen on the inside of the ceiling and you can see the little water droplets along here it's starting to drip so my non-drip roof is dripping with the ice on it and uh, that's quite annoying because it's dropping some water droplets onto my table. It's not getting onto the tools, it's only a couple of drops here and there. And this side of the table is complete, or this side of the roof is bone dry. So it's just a side in the shade. But you can see it all over the ceiling, which is kind of annoying because this is supposed to be a non-drip ceiling. So I'm having a bit of an issue. So I have to come in every morning and just kind of wipe off the water droplets. Like I say, it doesn't drip all day or anything. It's only as it thaws in the morning time. And it's only happening on very, very cold days where there's ice on the roof at night. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit annoying. It's supposed to be non drip, but as you can see, it's dripping. So that's one issue I'm having. Now, another question I get asked a lot is about the skylights. Do they drip? No, they don't. These have a coating on the inside of them. It's like a plastic material with a nylon weave in it. So this doesn't actually condensate and any water that forms on the corrugated skylight actually runs out on the top of this and drips outside. So it has a access to run out to the outside. So yeah, these skylights are coated with a kind of a quilted uh, plastic. It's kind of a heavy duty stuff with a nylon weave in it and that stops it. It's like an insulator as well. So that stops the skylights from dripping. So if you're wondering about the skylights, that's what's on them. Okay, so that's my condensation issues. Now the tool cabinet project that we're in the middle of, I'm trying to get that finished, but I'm, it's very, very busy in work at the minute. So, But I have picked up a nice big Sapili board and a nice big ash board here, just to do some more work on this tool cabinet. So the drawers, like I said, are gonna be Sapili fronts. I think we'll make the sides out of ash. We'll have a true dovetail. So you'll see the contrast between the ash and the Sapili, and we'll have a rebate for the bottom of our drawers, which we'll have to hide. So that makes it a little bit trickier when you see your dovetails come out through the front of your drawer. You have to hide the rebate because you can't continue it out to the front of the drawer or you'll see it within the dovetail. So a little bit trickier, not much to do, but I'll take you all through it when we're building the seven drawers. And I have all the offcuts ready to go, the tools laid out, so I have to start getting the tools into that cabinet now. So that's where we are with that. So uh, yeah, let's look at the MFT table. I'll give you an update on this project. Okay guys, update on the MFT table. Now I haven't done any more with this project. I just wanted to get some use, get some miles on this table so that I could see what we were going to do next. So I wanted to test it out and try it out, see where I'm going to need power, see what I'm going to do with dust extraction, see what I, I want to add to it and what I don't want to add to it. And I've given it a good test out now. So the sacrificial uh, strip is really doing its job. So you can see that's getting chewed up. 
so it's easy to replace. I have a couple of cuts that ran off it, but it doesn't really matter. Like I say, this part of the top can be replaced if it ever gets too damaged. But the sacrificial piece is a great idea. You can just run cuts in that all day long, not have to worry about it, and you can just remove it when you're, it gets too chewed up, and it's pretty chewed up at the minute. So one of the biggest issues I'm having with this is power. So I want to get power on this bench. Now, I didn't want to add the power to it because I'm going to put some metal conduit and some sockets around it and they will be on the outside. So I wanted to see what I was going to do with storage first before I put the sockets on the outside because that'll take up some space. But I kind of have an idea there now. So I'm definitely going to have two double sockets on this side, two double sockets on this side. We're going to put an appliance inlet socket down there and another appliance inlet socket on the wall or an outlet socket on the wall. And I'll just have a lead between the two and I can plug into that socket and then I'll be able to plug in my bench and I'll be able to unplug the bench, roll up that coil and leave it to the side and then wheel this off if I need to move it anymore. So we're going to put wheels on this as well. So in an upcoming video, I'm going to add power to this bench. I'm going to take you through the design of an electrical circuit, give you some things that you should look out for when you're planning uh, to wire your socket circuit, things about designing a circuit, the length of your run, thinking about the resistance of your circuit, the load of your circuit, all the little things without going super in depth, just little things that you should think about if you are um, planning on putting a circuit onto your bench or even into your workshop. It'll give you some ideas of what you should consider when installing a socket circuit. So I'll cover all that in it without getting too in depth into it. So you'll know what to ask your electrician or if you can do electrics yourself, you'll know exactly what you need to be thinking about. So there's a few things that you should think about. So uh, we'll do all that. So that's where I am with power. Definitely need power here and here because running leads onto the bench is a real problem. And I want to be able to unplug the bench and plug in the bench. So we're going to leave big enough sockets so that we can do that so we cover ourselves. So that's going to be coming up. Now, let's look at dust extraction. Okay, another area where I'm having issue along with power, running power leads onto the bench is a real uh, no-no. It it's really catches up with everything. So another problem I'm having is dust extraction. So especially with the track saw, getting dust extraction onto this and using the sander. So this is kind of my main sanding station now as well and assembly table because it's a really nice flat reference surface. It's a nice place to assemble things and to sand things. So I still do intend on turning some of this table, part of this table into a downdraft table. So I'll build a box under a section of these uh, dog holes. We'll use that as a downdraft table. We'll use that in conjunction with the dust extraction from the sander. So it won't just be downdraft table and no dust extraction on the sander. That would be no good. The downdraft table just pulls the dust down away from you. Any dust that escapes, it helps just pull that away. So we have to build that. Now, one of the issues I'm having is with the hose. So I want to get a decent hose. These kind of corrugated hoses, I find them very, very annoying. They're always rubbing and catching on everything. Uh, they're pulled on the track. They pull out of the track saw. They get snagged up. They're not very flexible. They're just annoying to use with sanders and track saws. So I know Festi will do can make a material one that's very smooth on the outside. So I might look at them. Um, I'm looking for a number of companies that supply kind of uh, smooth hoses that are a little bit longer that you can coil up, leave on the bench. So if you guys have any suggestions on good dust extraction hoses and where to get them, because I'm struggling to find it other than Festool at the minute, and the Festool ones are quite expensive. So um, yeah, let me know good suggestions in the comments below. That would be fantastic. Now, the dust extractor itself. So you guys know I love this Record Power DX4000. It's an extremely powerful and compact dust extractor. So I want to, I think what I'm going to do is let this be dedicated dust extractor for this table. I'll keep it on the wheels and use it as a shop vac as well. But it's really annoying when you're running a cut on your track saw, you have this plugged in and then you want to run over to use your planar thickness or you have to unplug everything and wheel this back over and plug it into the main dust extraction system. So what I'm thinking of is buying a bigger dust extractor, a dedicated dust extractor from my system that's going to go over here. I'll give you a quick look what I'm thinking about doing. Okay guys, so this is where I'm thinking about putting a main dust extractor. So I'm doing a bit of research now at the minute on what to actually buy. So I want a good one that gets down below one micron so that it filters the really fine dust. I'm going to sit it here so it's going to stand here permanently and then I'm going to have a flexible hose that I can just put across the door um, and into my dust extraction system or else I'm going to take this pipe work I'm going to raise it up high and uh, keep the dust extraction system high and then drop down to all the machines. The biggest issue I'm having is time. I have a limited amount of time in the workshop to get projects made and get videos uploaded. It's the constant wheeling this thing back and forward between my dust or between my sanders or my track saw 
and trying to use all this. So if I'm cutting something on the track saw, I have to wheel this over to plug it in. Then if I want to go to my miter saw, I have to unplug it, wheel it back around, plug it into my main system, and then they will cut on the miter saw. So that's quite annoying, it's quite time consuming. So this would not be a good setup for a professional user. It's absolutely fantastic dust extractor for the hobbyist, but if you're really under pressure for time, it's not such an ideal thing to be wheeling this between your hand tools and between your machines. So that's the problem I'm having at the minute. Along with the corrugated hose, which snags on everything, that's a real pain as well. So the plan is to use this as the main dust extractor for the MFT table. So I'll wheel that over here. We're gonna plumb something around the dust extraction table. So we'll have outlets on this side and outlets on this side that we can just plug the hoses for the tools into. And then we can wheel this over plug this into the MFT table and we'll have it working the downdraft and the tool um, dust extraction hoses. That's the plan. And then we'll have a main dust extractor to work all the machines. So that should really help speed things up in the shop. And in conjunction with this guy, which is doing an absolutely fantastic job, uh, it helps really keep the air in here and health is wealth at the end of the day. And uh, saving time is also uh, paramount at the minute. So that's the issues of the MFT table. Now let me take you through the track saw and the tracks and some things we wanna do with that. Okay, so just a quick look at the tracks um, and storage. So I haven't added any cabinets to the underneath of this yet because I'm just trying to figure out what way I want to work it. Now, it's really annoying having the tracks inside in behind the legs. It's awkward getting them in and out. And you want nice, quick access. Anything that you can do to make your work flow that bit easier really makes the whole workshop experience that bit better. So what I'm planning on doing is building a holder for the tracks that sit out here. So they'll just sit down into it. When you want to grab a track, you just come over here, lift it up, and throw it onto the table, nice and simple. Like I say, you're constantly trying to feed things in and around this table. It's just a little bit awkward. It's not very user friendly. So definitely going to build something to sit out here and uh, the tracks will just slot into like this so they're readily available. So that means we're not going to build any cabinets in here or in here. The only cabinet that I'm going to build is down this end for the router table. So in order to keep this place nice and clean, a lot of chippings fall off the router down inside in here. So we want to build a cabinet to catch all that. So we'll build a small cabinet with a drawer underneath. The drawer will be for the router table fence and all the router equipment can sit down into that. We can just close it up and then we'll have a cabinet that will catch all the chippings and dust that fall down off the router table in the, into that cabinet and we can just hoover that out and vacuum that out every now and again. So that's the plan. So we're gonna leave this all open. We're gonna have a dust extraction system. We'll have our sockets that will mount around the bench as well. We'll plumb in, or like I say, our dust extraction system and we'll have a place to put our tracks on the outside as well as adding wheels to this. I think that's how this table is gonna function at its best. Okay, as for the, the MFT table itself, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm really enjoying using it. You, you guys have seen all the jigs that I'm using with it. It's nice, quick, and easy to set up. However, it has a major limiting factor that's stopping me unlocking the potential of this table, and that are the Bosch tracks. Now, I'll, do, I'll go into the Bosch tracks on in a minute because some of you guys are having issues with this, and I'm having similar issues, so we'll do that in a second. But for, as regards the tracks, the tracks are absolutely fantastic when it comes to the linking system. So joining Bosch tracks, if you've seen my review of the Bosch tracks, so you'll have seen how simple it is to join these tracks and get them perfectly straight. That's the biggest selling factor of the Bosch tracks. But when using them with an MFT table, because the Bosch tracks are overhangs the edge of the of the, the track itself, it's a real issue. So it's so fast and easy to set up your MFT table. A couple of dogs, put your piece against it. Two dogs this way, and now you're ready for a perfect 90 degree cut. And using the small tracks is very very easy. However, you can't use the small track with the Bosch tracks. So as you can see, it hits the dogs. So you can't actually complete your cut. That's very annoying. These are system is kind of designed to be used with the likes of the Festool track. The Festool track, like I've said in previous videos, has like an extra 15 to 20 mil on this side. So it sits off the dogs and it keeps the track saw away from the dog. So I've got two options. The Bosch, the nice thing about the Bosch track saw is it has a removable black strip here. So once you remove that, this Bosch track saw will fit onto everybody else's track. So it'll fit on the Festool, the Makita, the Dewalt track. It'll go onto all of them. So my option is I can go and buy 
a festival track, which will work better with this MFT table, or I can go to benchdogs.co.uk, get some bench dog skier, which is what I think I'm gonna do so I can do a review on it and try it out. So I'm gonna buy some of that myself. They do a dog with a T uh, nut on top of it that will slide into this. Now that will really make, that'll be a real game changer for using this table. So that's something I have to do. I have to buy some dogs with a T nut, and if I don't think they're gonna work, then I'll have to get a festival track because I'm invested in this Bosch track saw now, and I'm not going to run out and spend money on a festival track saw, which is maybe what I should have done in the first place. But uh, yeah, that's kind of is where it is, and that's at where it's at. The tracks don't work with an MFT table unless we have T-slots, dogs, or we change the track. Now, like I said, the nice thing is, it will fit on everybody else's track. So we'll see, this is something I have to sort out. Okay, so on to the issues with the Bosch track saw. Now this kind of one made me laugh. I was having issues with this not cutting square. If you guys have been following along with the hand tool cabinet build. So when I built the carcass, I had to redo all my cuts because this thing wasn't cutting back at zero or 90 degrees, whatever way you want to look at it. And it just so happened as I was making that video, about 10 of you messaged me on Instagram saying, you're having problems with your Bosch track saw. When you move it off zero, it's not returning to zero. What the hell is going on? <laughs> it was absolutely amazing the fact that I had that issue and then I got 10 messages about the issue before I even said anything. That really did make me laugh. So let me address and show you how to do this properly. It's a bit of an issue with this Bosch track saw. It has a system that I don't really like, if I'm honest, and uh, it's a nuisance when you uncover this or you discover this problem after you've made a bunch of cuts and then you realize that your cuts aren't perfectly 90 degrees uh, yeah like what happened to me and I had to spend a half a day then redoing all my cuts so let me get you in for a closer look and I'll show you how to set up this Bosch track saw and the actual issue with it let's have a look okay so let's have a look what was the problem that you guys were having same as what I was having so when you adjust this Bosch track saw so let's say you want to do a 45 degree motor loosen the screws front and back Knock it over to 45, lock it down, make your cut, happy days, and then return it back to zero down here, lock it in place, make your cut. And what I found, and what all you guys are finding, is that when you put your square on your edge, that that edge is not perfectly square to the face, so it's not cutting at 90 degrees. It's not re returning to zero degrees, which is a real issue. Now, this Bosch track saw has a button on the back here, which you press in, it gives you a negative one degree, which I don't know why you would need that. So if someone in the comments, uh, cabinet makers out there, like I say, I'm only an electrician, I'm not a cabinet maker. Is there a reason why you need that negative one degree? If there is, let me know. But the, the issue with having that option there means that the track saw, the metal plate of the track saw, this part here doesn't sit on the metal plate of the base that runs along the track when you return this to zero. So it has a stop in here. So this is the things you guys were struggling with and you didn't know what the story was. So there is a grub screw right in here that you adjust. So it's a little bit awkward to set this up. So um, let me try and see if I can show you this. But the grub screw is there. And you wanna pop your blade out and make sure that it's exactly 90 degrees to the base. I'll show you now, get an engineer square to do that. And then we adjust the grub screw that's right in here. Okay, so let's adjust this now. It's a 2.5 Allen key. There's the grub screw right there. That sets the grub screw against the stop that stops this at zero degrees. So. In order to adjust this to make sure that it's 100% right, and you should really do this with all your tools, regardless of how expensive they were, never assume that everything is, that all these marks are exact, or all these marks are exact. Um, someone at the factory could have had a bad day, and you could have just got one of those tools, but it seems like everybody with a Bosch track saw is having this issue. I mean, 10 of you messaged me about this. So, set your stop all the way down so that you can get your maximum depth of cut. We want to drop our blade out and this is where it gets a little bit awkward so you kind of want to hold the motor and your thumb against the base this is the easiest way i found to do it so it keeps that perfectly out and then you want to get your engineer square hopefully you guys can see this and you want to put it against your blade now you don't want to put it against the teeth of your blade because the blade has a curve you want to make sure that you're in between those teeth and you're on to the actual body of the blade itself and you want to check. Now I've already set this up, so I'm perfectly 90 degrees there now. 
So that's against my stop. That's all the way down. It can't go any further. If you're not at 90 degrees, depending on whether you want to tilt it this way or this way, you'll either slacken off that screw or screw in that screw and that will close up your gap. So it's always good to have good quality engineer squares as well for setting up all your machines. So that's how you do it. Once that's perfectly at 90 degrees, set your grub screw and you're good to go and then it will return to 90 degrees. Now, it's against the plastic mechanism, which is another thing I don't like. So let me give you a close up of that and uh, why you probably have to check this regularly if you have a Bosch track saw because it's after my confidence in this tool is lessened. Now, I'll be honest with you. So let's have a look. Okay, it's a little bit hard to get this because it's all black plastic and it's hard to see, but there's your button for negative one, so when, negative one degree. So when this comes against your stop, you can push that in and it'll let you drop this saw down an extra one degree. So you'll be negative one past zero or past 90. It'll be essentially 91 degrees or negative one degree, depending on what way you're looking at this. And your grub screw hits against this plastic stop here. So that's what's stopping you back at zero degrees. The grub screw is right here and it sits against this plastic stop here. Now having a plastic stop in my idea, opinion is not great because plastic can wear, it can be flexible. You know, it's not great, it's not ideal. So know that's where you're stopping against and there's your grub screw and this is what's causing us the issue. The fact that this saw can go negative one degree, it means, I can get this on camera now, it means that the plate in here, let's see, oh, where are we? Here's the bottom of our track saw, and this is what runs on the guide. So this plate doesn't actually sit on this when you return to zero. It sits on against the grub screw and the plastic stop. Now, the other thing about that, let me show you the uh, scale that we have here. So now you can see the scale. Now you can see I have this perfectly set with the engineer square back at 90 degrees or zero degrees. So you can see the arrow is slightly above zero degrees. So the scale is actually slightly off. So that's probably an issue you're having as well. If you're going by these marks, if you put that arrow directly onto the zero degrees, which it should be, this is not a cheap tool by any stretch of the imagination. It's not the most expensive track saw. I mean, the Mafel and the Fest tool are more expensive, but this is the Bosch Professional range. This is not good enough, in my opinion. You saw me now check this with the um, engineer square to say that that's at zero degrees or 90 degrees and it's slightly above it's about a half a degree above the zero mark here so this arrow doesn't actually line up with zero degrees when this track saw is at zero degrees so hopefully that helps you out guys i know you're all having problems i've seen it on some forums as well maybe i should have done this as a standalone video but uh, i'll include it in the title of this workshop vlog problems with the boss track saw so there you go Okay, so there you go guys, hopefully that helps some of you out. Now, like I said, I probably should have made this a standalone video. It probably would be worth, if I get keep getting more and more questions on this, I might do it as a standalone video. But uh, that's the Bosch track saw. Now, you guys on this channel know that I'm 100% honest when it comes to my tools. Even if I spend a fortune on tools, if they're rubbish, they're rubbish. I'm not gonna try and convince myself that they're good when they're not good. That, in my opinion, is not good enough. The saw itself, works brilliantly. I've no complaints with the motor, the blade it comes with, the tracks, other than they don't work with the MFT top. A um, little bit of an issue there, but the fact that uh, it's not set up to drop back to zero, it has that negative one degree, which means that it's not sitting on its own plate. It's sitting against the grub screw. Not, not a great idea for me. It's not a good system now. Like I said, let me know in the comments why that negative one degree is needed. I don't have an explanation for you guys now, but there's some brilliant people that watch my channel. They'll be able to let me know. So issue with another tool. Let's have a look. Okay guys, an issue with another tool that I have, it's the Veritas Honing Guide System. I'm starting to notice a little problem with this and I wanted to give you guys an update before you go out and spend your money on it. Now you guys know I loved this system when I first got it. I still like it to this day, but it has a major flaw and issue. So let me give you a look and it's with this cambered roller. Okay guys, so the Veritas Honing Guide System. Now this, when I first got it, it was an absolutely great system. It's, it's really good with the flat roller uh, for doing your chisels and stuff like that. It's so easy to set up and get a consistent blade angle. So it's great, especially using with the lapping plates or water stones or diamond plates, that kind of thing. It's a great jig. However, the cambered roller and the flat roller, they're made from brass. Let's get the camera to focus on that if it will camera cooperate with me now. So this has a camber roller. So as you can see, I don't know if this will come out on the video now, the camber is wearing on one side. Camera, 
please cooperate. There we go. So this camber wheel now is no longer a consistent camber. It's flattening on one side. So that's affecting how I'm sharpening the blade. So obviously when I'm pushing on it, I'm favoring one side over the other and it's flattening out the camber on one side. So it's Veritas Dew Cell Replacement Cambered Wheels. Again, it's brass. Brass is a soft metal. If you're using it on a diamond plate or lapping plates or anything like that, you are going to wear the brass wheels. It's just an issue. And like I say, I have a flat spot now to one side of my cambered wheel, which is uh, affecting, it's, it's take, removing material from one side of the plane blade more than the other. So I'm only using the flat wheel now. So that's a real issue with the Veritas honing guide, the Mark II system. So just be aware of that if you're thinking about getting one of these. Now guys, the upshot of that is I'm kind of come up thinking of changing my method for sharpening my chisels and my hand planes. So I'm thinking about getting back into hand sharpening. Now I used to hand sharpen all my hand blades when I first got into woodworking. I'm really used to putting edges on knives and stuff like that. I've been doing that for years, so sharpening plane blades wasn't really an issue for me. But uh, I found I, I quite like the speed with which you can sharpen things by hand without using the jigs. It's just a matter of getting a feel for it. Now, I've watched all the best guys who hand sharpen their tools. They still use grinders with jigs to set their primary bevel to ensure that that's perfect. And then they just touch up their tools by hand sharpening. So I'm looking at maybe getting into some water stones, maybe some diamond plates, building a little water pond, maybe from a nice wooden water pond that we can use. So it'll be an upcoming project. If I do decide to go down that road, I'll certainly uh, give you guys an update and show you the techniques. I think Rod, Rob Cosman's technique for sharpening, I love how fast and how efficient that is. He has a diamond plate and a water stone and he's just seconds to put an edge back on his tools. Now he does set his primary bevel using a jig and a grinder. So he makes sure that's 100% right first and then he hand sharpens. He, he actually puts a secondary and tertiary bevel on his blade but I really like how he does it. It seems so quick, easy and efficient and you can't argue with the results he gets. So that's something I'm thinking about doing. So an upcoming project, we'll be building a nice little water bath that we can house some water stones if I decide to go down that road and get back into hand sharpening. But I'll certainly keep you guys updated. Let me know how you guys sharpen and what you recommend and what you use. I'd be always fascinated to hear your opinions on that subject as well. Okay guys, so that's kind of it for the tools and the projects. That's where we're at with them at the minute. So hopefully that Bosch track saw and showing you that Veritas um, thing will help some of you guys out. Now, as for the channel, the channel is going great at the minute. The views are up, subscribers are up, and it's really growing. It's kind of growing faster and faster with every month, which is absolutely fantastic. It's projected to hit about 30,000 subscribers, I think, by sometime in February, which is absolutely mind-boggling. I never thought I'd get that far up. But uh, yeah, you guys really seem to be enjoying what I'm doing here, and you're getting benefit from it. So that's the most important thing. So long as that people are getting a benefit and they're not just coming on here to watch me uh, talk nonsense in a workshop. That's absolutely fantastic that you're getting something from it. And I read all your emails, all your messages, like I've said multiple times before. Um, I don't always get a chance to reply because there's so many of them coming in now, but just know that I read every single one of them. I actually read them all almost immediately, but I don't get a chance to get back to everybody. I try to get back to as many people as I can. So yeah, thanks very much. There's some absolutely amazing long emails some of you guys have sent me, which have been really, really, uh, uh, heartwarming to read that you're really enjoying the channel and you're sharing some of the stuff that you're doing so that's absolutely fantastic keep them going guys because I love to read them even if I don't get a chance to respond to everybody so that's where we're at now with regards to sponsorship and all that kind of thing, I've been in talks, like I said, with multiple sponsors. I've put everything on hold for a while. Brexit has made it really hard to get stuff from the UK. That's a bit of a nightmare. So hopefully that sorts itself out soon because it's hard to get stuff in Ireland. Ireland is such a small market. The UK was so handy. They have a much larger market, especially when it comes to woodworking and hobbyist stuff. You can get all the hand tools from the UK. It's a little bit harder. There are some good shops in Ireland, but they don't always stock stuff. So the carpentry store in Nace, if you're looking for a good place to get hand tools, that's a good shop to go to. I buy stuff from them the whole time. Um, and there's a few other shops around the country that do power tools, but most of the stuff I was getting from the UK because you can get all the, the really good hand tools and stuff over there. They have a much larger market for all this kind of stuff. But like I say, Brexit is making it hard to do that at the minute. And the rolling lockdowns with coronavirus is really hindering what I can make content wise. I can't travel more than five kilometers from my own house. I can't travel around the country. I can't go to buy timber. I can't go to get anything. It's a real disaster at the minute. So I've put all sponsors on hold because 
I can't actually commit to getting content out. And some of the sponsors won't control your videos and stuff like that. I'm not doing that. I've emailed them back, I've told them that's not happening. I'm keeping control of my own videos and I'm only making content for sponsors that relate to what I'm doing in this shop. So if it's not something I spend my own money on or it's not a tool that I don't use myself, I'm not doing sponsor content on it. So just let any potential sponsors out there know that's the terms and conditions for working on this channel. I'd be more than more than happy to work with guys who are in this industry, no problem. In fact, there's a couple of tool companies that I am working with who are I spend my own money and they're absolutely fantastic to deal with. They will just send you stuff and you can say anything you like. They usually send you great products so you don't give bad reviews about them. So that kind of thing I'm more than happy to do. But when it comes to everything else, I'm not doing it. I have a business already. I don't need a second business. So that's kind of where I'm at with the channel and sponsors. So there you go. Okay, so there we go guys. That is workshop vlog number 15. It's January 23rd, 2021. It's just a monthly update video. Let you guys know what's going on in the shop, what's coming up. Give you some updates on a few tools and things like that and check in with you guys. And Hopefully you're all doing well. Hopefully you're all staying safe in this current climate. 2021 is going to be another tough year, but we made it through 2020 and they were all badly affected by this COVID thing. So know that you're not alone out there guys. I know the crack, I know what it's like and uh, it's quite tough and hard for everybody. So uh, we'll soldier on. We'll keep the bright side out and we get through this and we get to the end of 2021 and hopefully we'll see some light at the end of the tunnel. I'll keep the content coming, try and keep you guys entertained uh, through all this madness. And uh, like I say, thanks for all your support. Thanks for all the comments. Special thanks to everybody over on Patreon. Uh, you guys are really helping support the channel now. So that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, I appreciate uh, immensely all your support and donations. That's absolutely fantastic. It's gonna help me get more and more projects and stuff for this channel in the coming year. So again, massive thanks to everybody over there. Links to everything guys, as always, are in the description. Any comments and questions you have for me, just leave them in the comment section below. I'll try and get back to you. So that's kind of it. We have to get back to this hand tool cabinet now. I have a load of stuff scattered everywhere. The workshop's in a mess. So I'm anxious to get this finished, to get this place tidied up again. So I'll crack on with this and we'll have some videos on this coming up in the next week so until then guys take it easy look after yourselves and your family stay safe out there and i shall see you in the next one take it easy